the reason I fell in love with the story was I had always, I like things that surprised me. And I had, you know, like any, almost anybody raised in, in the West, Genghis Khan's the barbarian, right? He's, he's the, the guy who, he's a boogeyman. He's something that might one day return and eat you all up. He kills and rapes and pillages. And, you know, I, I was looking for something to write. And a friend of mine had said, oh, you should just do the Genghis Khan conquering things. You know, like go, go have him, you know, knock down walls and kill people and, you know, great and terrible. And I bought one particular book. I had a, I ended up buying a lot of books and reading a lot of different things, but I bought one particular book called Genghis Khan, the making of the modern world. And the opening of it is his mother being kidnapped when she's 15 and her, his real father, who's never really named fleeing because he loves her and she tells him to flee because I love you too and I want you to live from the men who kidnap her and then he's raised as a boy and the story of Genghis Khan as a boy suddenly I'm like he's a real of course he's real there's no mythology inside of you know an unborn child kidnapped in the womb um you know two teenagers on the step going home you know, being accosted, these sorts of things felt like could be any day, right? You know, young, young people in love and having their lives ruined by bandits or bad guys or thugs. Um, And of course, one of the thugs ends up being his stepfather who loves him and raises him and treats him like his own son. And the surprise, even just immediately the surprises, Um, the unexpected humanity, which was such, you know, a contrast from a man who makes the streets of Beijing sizzle with human fat, you know, 50 years later. And there's, you know, for me, it was really answering a question of who the hell was this guy? You know, I, I, and I, I fell in love with that exploration. And I sort of also knowing my, my kind of like hero's journey bullet points as you're trained to do. And you're, you know, you're sort of starting as a writer. Um, he's like archetypical. Um, just over and over again, and and you know his adversities were always humongous and always life threatening, and if not mortal, emotionally mortal. Um, and that's where I'm like, I mean, I'm not drawn to movies about punching people in the face and killing and raping if you don't give a shit about the people involved, if you don't understand why they're doing it, or at least you don't ask why they're doing it, because then what's the point? It's just gratuitous, you know, it's masquerade. And I'd, I'd rather see a story with love and passion and hope and fear and understand the incredible will and drive of a young boy. Nevin, yeah. I, I, feel, I feel that there's a couple of interpretations here of Genghis Khan. One is, even in your own script writing, one is where Genghis Khan is a young boy and he has this enormous hero's journey ahead of him. He actually is the good guy, right? For and, sure, for about 40 years, arguably yeah. the good guy. <laughs> so he is, he is the good guy here. And I feel like we should almost talk about that as a separate um, myth, mythology. And then there's a point where it was pretty, you know, a lot of people believed he was the bad guy. A lot of people believed that he was for creating more human destruction than humans, human consolidation, right? So let's talk about what were the ideas that he had and the, let's call it fantasy bubbles he had during the time he was still on the hero's journey. Let's take that from say age eight all the way up to age 40. So what all right. were the things that he was trying to accomplish his different fantasies, his different, his different thoughts and processes which formed the larger idea. And then we'll get to the larger idea. Well, there's a, a couple of like emotional nuggets inside of him. One of those is even though he is going to be this terrible rapist and pillager, his love of women, it's a very awkward thing, but he very much loved his mother and loved his first wife, who was his only empress, his only official wife, and empowered them and protected them and then wrote laws about the enshrining protection for women because he'd known his whole life my mother was kidnapped when she was 15 and forced into 
you know, another man's tent. And even though he does that, when he grows up, he, uh, he hates it. He hates it in others. And he thinks it, he thinks it's evil. Certainly it's evil to do to Mongolians. You know, there's also one of the things to think about is he's very much Mongolian, mm. you know, and, and at the time, Mongolia, of course, is not this country. It's a, it's a, it's not even really a notion. It's just a, it's sort of almost like an ethnographic thing full of diverse families, which are effectively these tribes, these massive tribes, and it spreads and moves and churns. And one of the things he saw was the, in the grand tradition of great men, um, the, the enemy isn't the neighbor next door. It isn't the tribe over there. The, the, the enemy is the foreigner who's coming into our homeland and making us turn against each other. And the people who then truck with them and work with them against the other Mongols. And he really did come up with this, or certainly made it the point for all Mongols. He, he, he ends up getting rid of the notions of these distinct tribes, which are basically nation states within this, this area. Don't you think and that came later? It does come later, but it, I think right. as a child, I think as a child, he, he learned the lesson of, I don't know why I hate this, you know, the, um, the Tiekyu. I don't know why I should, I should hate them. Right. Just because, you know, they're technically my cousins, you know, distant related cousins. And yet they're also the ones who wrong me. But why do they wrong me? Because I'm here and I'm weak. Um, it's very You've much. You've already a, identified two, right? You've already identified two, let's just say narratives he had developed as a young boy. The first narrative he had developed in his mind is there has to be some way to protect women, right? Very powerful idea in that time of history. The second idea was, I don't want to be put in a place where I'm killing my cousins. Idea number yeah. two. I think the idea of the true foreigner came later, but let's talk about this revolutionary, the protection of women almost deserves its own podcast, right? But so let's talk about the second one, which is, I don't want to, I'm Mongolian. What does that mean? How did he come up with that when the rest of Mongolia, which was a form of loose tribes, how did he come up with the idea that there is such a thing as Mongolian? Well, partially it's, he made his own family, even though he had a family and, and um, obviously he had lots of brothers and he had, a, he had a mother and a father. His father is very much absent um, and his stepfather fills that role. Already he's blended, like right from birth. He's not just this particular tribe. He, his, the tribe he's associated with isn't even his birth tribe. You know, the Brigid, the Brigid, who, uh, by the way, I'm going to butcher every fucking, all of it, because I'm, I'm a white dude. Um, I'm just not good at it, but I love it. The, the tribe he's associated with, the tribe that's his tribe, the tribe that bears his name, isn't his blood tribe. Right away, family for him isn't blood and thus everything changes you know from from so early in his life he he is living the life of the bastard and yet also loved by the people who bastardized him and why not just get rid of the bastard then you know why not get rid of the thing that makes you hate and just be family and you know, part of that comes out in the whole notion of he doesn't raise up the people who are blooded to him to the highest positions. He raises up the people who are loyal and who are talented. And he rewards them if they're talented and punishes them if they're not or if they're bad or if they're traitors. And it's really so simple. It's like, I mean, it's one of those like, boy, that's a really simple idea. Raise up the good. Yeah. But think them. about it as a young boy to have these completely revolutionary concepts floating around in your mind. Let's protect well, women and let's redefine the notion of what a family is. A family is not something that is tied together necessarily by blood, but by shared experiences. So you already have two, right? Two big, big concepts floating around a, a 10 year old's mind. I would right. say these are the definitive concepts because he does this for the rest of his life. Um, yeah. Even though he does horrible, I mean, I mean, horrible without any like specific judgment of reasoning for why he does it, utterly horrible things, um, which are totally rational from his point of view. He's also bringing 
this incredibly, by the time he's super old, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, which is amazing that this guy just doesn't care what religion you are. Yeah. Come hang out, dude. You know, like, let's go get a drink and talk about God. Weirdly hippie-ish in his, like, approach to... He doesn't fit a particular, like, political mode. He just was sort of like, if you're with me, if you're good to me, you're my family. Um, you're, and, you know, certainly it becomes his family. And he is the father, which is where you sort of get it into his Robin Hood Jesus space. Um, but it's a family. And, it, and it's about, you know, considering America's having Thanksgiving tomorrow. It's inviting people to the table. And those who come are welcome.